Hey guys, welcome back to Keys to the Cosmos. Well, I don't even remember the last time we did an Ask Photography Target Tips video, but I think this is number 22. And I was able to capture a target that I haven't, as of yet, through my almost two years of Ask Photography. And I was really excited to finally have A, the right telescope to do it, and to be able to sink a little bit of time into it. So the target is M82, also known as the Cigar Galaxy. Now, we know that winter time, at least here in North America, is typically galaxy season. Um, most of the galaxies are in the north, and at that time of the year, they're in view for, uh, for most people, you know, at a certain latitude. But uh, unfortunately, this winter for me, between not great weather, which has been the story for over a year now, and just a busy schedule, I wasn't able to get out that much during the winter to capture some of the galaxies I want to. But M82 was definitely on the top of my list. Um, I never made a video on it, but I was able to capture the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, really proud of this picture. I think it's one of my better ones. Um, I probably won't do a video on it just because I've done one before and, uh, you know, the results are night and day from the, from the very first attempt. But of course, now with the proper telescope, with my ED-127, I was able to capture it much better. So I was very proud of that image. But uh, even more uh, s smaller and a little more challenging, I would say, is M82. Now, you probably know M81 and M82, generally speaking, if you follow a lot of astrophotography accounts on Instagram or Facebook or whatever it is that you follow, uh, you'll see them photographed together. Now, these are actually two galaxies that are... Um, gravitationally interacting with one another. So it's kind of cool. It's not just that they happen to be in the same field of view, they actually are interacting with one another and are fairly close in terms of, of course, space proximity. But M82 I love in particular because it's what's called a starburst uh, galaxy. Now I'm gonna show you an image. Now just keep in mind, tempered expectations when you see this compared to mine at the end of this video because um, obviously this is done with like Hubble or one of those telescopes. So realistically, you're not going to find too many, you know, amateur astrophotographers that can get a picture even close to this. But here's a picture of M82 from NASA. And you can see it sort of looks like it's exploding from the middle. That's what they mean by a starburst galaxy. So it's a bit of a unique one, very pretty, very, uh, you know, unusual compared to the typical spiral and you know, all galaxies are beautiful, but this one in particular always caught my attention. I, I always wanted to image it from the first time I saw it. And basically, I'm not an astrophysicist or astronomer, but I believe it's because of the, that interaction with M81 that it's producing stars at an like, insane rate, something like 10 times what the Milky Way does. And that's what's causing that starburst effect. It's just incredible um, star production that's going on in that center of that galaxy. So... Pretty amazing and it looks really cool as a result. So it was definitely on the top of my list uh, this year and now that I have my Explorer Scientific ED-127. So let's talk all about it and we're going to do something different in this video. Uh, the second half I'm going to flip to the computer and I'm going to show you as the, the title how to combine um, narrow band and broadband. So when we say narrow band and broadband we're talking about one shot color. We're not talking about mono imaging which is typically when you use those, but still using a one-shot color, but using two different filters and combining that um, data and what are the benefits of that. So we'll talk about that, but look forward to that at the end, of, towards the end of this video. So let's just briefly go through it. Uh, where is M82 located? Well, it's located in Ursa Major. Now, of course, Ursa Major is a well-known constellation and within it is one of the most well-known um, you know, figures that we look for, the Big Dipper. That's sort of that handle with the four stars uh, that make up sort of the pan, if you will. It kind of looks like a frying pan in the sky. Um, and M82 and N81, M81 obviously, are right near that Big Dipper. So if you can find the Big Dipper, you should be able to locate roughly where M82 is. Now it is quite small, and I think it's... Uh, I think it's uh, something like an 8 as to... Um, magnitude so not not bad somewhere in the middle um, I mean you're not going to see this with your naked eyes obviously and you're going to need a good telescope to be able to do it justice if you want to uh, image it individually now if you're going to go wide field and shoot the two of them you can shoot this with uh, I mean you still don't want uh, something 
too wide field with too little focal length but you know you can get away with a smaller scope and be able to image the two of them together but if you want to get details i would say the ed127 is about as small as you'd want to go i mean if you're willing to sink a ton of time and then really crop you can do it but i wish i would have used my edge hd um, for this because that's how small and hard it is to resolve details in this galaxy but anyway ursa major now i'll use my stellarium pictures here to help you see where it is so if we we talk about sort of the handle and the pot itself of the big dipper so if you take the one corner star and go through into the other corner and kind of extend that line out as you can see here that's roughly where m81 and m82 are um i've never i have never located them myself um like i used to with my star tracker manually so i'm not speaking to experience here though i have found many other ones like uh, the whirlpool and pinwheel you know back then i used to find all of them manually but i'm not going to pretend on this one i've never found it manually but it shouldn't be too difficult as i said if you just sort of draw your line through it and and then it's sort of just sort of off to the side a little bit so it'll take some playing i'm sure uh, particularly the more focal length you're using it's it's trickier to do that but uh, obviously if we're using a go-to mount that won't be an issue but if you are using a star tracker and a smaller telescope um, it may take you a bit of time so give yourself time and also keep in mind that the big dipper is always in the sky all year round so depending on the season it'll be upright now it's starting to turn and then in the summer it goes all the way around so it just sort of makes a circle throughout the year so keep that in mind the way I'm showing it here in Stellarium is for this time of year we're currently in June of 2022 but if you're going to be doing this next winter then you know it probably be in the upright position and so you can adjust accordingly as to where to find it but shouldn't be too difficult and at least it's in an easy to find uh, constellation like ursa major now let's talk a little bit about uh framing it up now as i mentioned if you're going to be shooting m82 specifically you're going to want a lot of focal length focal length I would say at least um, 500 and up. You know, the more the better. Uh, I use my ED127, so with a focal reducer that has 667 millimeters of focal length. So that's, to me, you know, even on the low side, I wish I had more, but I was able to get a decent picture. Hopefully you'll agree when you see it at the end of this video. Um, and basically, obviously, just try to get it centered. Even with, now I should mention, I use the uh, ASI 533. So that's the square sensor camera I've talked about it many times so it's smaller it gives you the illusion of being cropped more and hence more magnification so it's a smaller area of sky um, if you were to shoot both these together and use something like the ASI 294 you probably could get M81 M and M82 in the picture um, on a single exposure I believe here you can see M82 I think M81 sorry in the corner and if you, if not it's right there I may have just cropped it but you can just see a piece of it, I remember that. So, yeah, with the 294, you probably could sneak the both of them in. But I was focusing on M82 and just trying to get as much detail as possible. So, framing it up, pretty simple, especially if you're just going for the single uh, galaxy. Now let's talk about integration time. So, this is where this video, uh, towards the end of the video, I'll explain more. But... Um, if you're in light pollutes, guys like I am, Bordo 8.5, 9, give or take, depending on which app you look at, uh, it's, it, well, galaxies, let's be honest, are difficult in general. So we're using a broadband, right, um, filter. We don't want narrow band because that actually blocks a lot of the light that we want to come into our camera sensor. And that's the kind of light that galaxies are putting out. So for the most part, I used... A broadband filter now i got eight hours of data with that broadband filter but as we talked about ma2 is a very unique galaxy it's a starburst and all of that red you see bursting out of it that's ha so if you really want to pull that out well then you need to use a narrowband filter at least in, in my kind of skies to capture that and then you need to combine that and that's what we're going to talk about in the processing part of this video so i added i think it was four hours of narrowband um, I think I used my L Extreme, or it might have been, um, actually, I think it was my Triad Ultra filter. And then I combined them, and that's where I got the most detail. Um, 
I'll show you. So here's this, that single exposure that I kind of showed very briefly before. And you can see it fairly clearly. There's, if you look really close, there is a little bit of that starburst red, but not a lot. Obviously, this is just a three minute unguided exposure. But um, you're going to need to sink some time with this if you want to really capture detail. And as I mentioned, you're going to need both forms. So in my case, I had 12 hours total, which is for me a lot. That's probably one of the highest, if not the highest I've ever done on an image. But it was necessary. I want to show you my original quick process with just the eight hours of broadband. So here it is here. You can see not very great and very little of that red. There is some, but not a lot. You're going to see the difference at the end of this video, what um, combining the data and then processing it accordingly made to pull out that red. It made quite the difference. So integration time, you're going to want to sink some time. Now. Unless you're under dark skies, uh, it's going to be a challenge to pull that, that, or that HA out. And that's what makes this ga this galaxy so beautiful. You see that first picture. Without that, it's really not very good. I mean, I mean, it was a fairly quick process, but even still, I couldn't really pull it out. That's when I knew well, I'm going to have to sink in a, in a, a little, you know, at least a half night of narrow band and see what I can do with it. So, yeah, be prepared to sink some time if you really want to do it justice. And hopefully, if you have a good amount of focal length, you'll be able to do that. So now we're going to go to processing. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing of processing because this video will be an hour long. But what I want to focus on is how at least I com combine narrowband and broadband. So um, you guys may have a different way of doing it. I'm sure there's a better way. But this is how I did it and it seemed to work because you'll see at the end of this video the draft drastic difference between that first version and when I added in the narrowband. So in order to move to this part of the video, let's flip over to the computer and hopefully I'll be able to show you how to combine narrowband and broadband data.